southeast of captured Carr, the Allies are consolidating for the final Battle of France. The greatest bombing attack of the war opened the way for General Montgomery's armor. Mine sweeping tanks and other heavy equipment rolled the Nazis back along the road to Falaise. This Normandy countryside is about to witness one of the decisive battles of the war. Britain's first soldier finds time to make new friends in France. Stolid Norman peasants turn out to greet the Allied commander. One of the first assignments of the liberating force is the care of refugees. They are being quickly rehabilitated and civil administration returned to the hands of the French. 2,000 refugees had taken shelter in Carr's Church of saint Etienne, which the Allied bombers took care to leave undamaged. The town folk were moved out of range of Nazi artillery. First, they were given a good meal. Then they assembled outside the church to await transportation provided by the army. As these pictures appear, Khan once again is outside enemy shelling range and the town is prepared for resettlement for its citizens. Members of the French underground are able to get back into uniform and take part openly in the campaign against the Nazis. The townspeople clip the hair of the women who were too friendly to the Nazis. It was their way of distinguishing those who collaborated with the Germans. Shorn of their crowning glory, these girls would find it difficult to attract anyone, even a Nazi. On the battlefield, a Russian prisoner requested permission to return to the enemy lines and bring the rest of his platoon back with him. He and his comrades had been forced to serve in the German army, but they grasped this opportunity to put an end to their slavery. till now is the important part played by plywood in the invasion of Normandy. Birch, maple and mahogany go into the making of this newly developed war material. After being boiled for 24 hours, the logs are first turned to true roundness before going into the machine that planes off the veneer of which plywood is formed. So thin is the wood sheeting that more than a mile is yielded by a single log. And then it moves into a drying oven which reduces the moisture of the wood. Alternate sheets of wood and glue make up the plywood. The preparation of the sheet glue is a secret. The secret also of the tremendous strength of the finished product. Layers of wood and glue are stacked up like leaves of a book. The materials next go into machine press, under whose pressure they form finished plywood. This can be put to many war uses. Regiments are now crossing rivers in Normandy over pontoons floating on plywood boats. The Army's folding boats, often used by forward units, are also made of plywood. They are light but stand up to the roughest treatment. The glider is another wartime application of plywood. Here are motorless aircraft of the kind Allied divisions flew into France. Their lightness and strength were of the greatest value to the airborne troops. The greatest triumph of all in the field of plywood is the Mosquito, fastest operational aircraft in the world. Allied air leaders call for a fighter bomber of such speed that it could bomb Berlin in broad daylight and get back again. The designer's problem was to cut down weight, and planes of plywood were the answer, an answer that will also be given to many post-war problems. Not since 1939, two months before the outbreak of war, have European Frenchmen openly celebrated Bastille Day. 
But here in Liberated Cherbourg, July 14, 1944, was a scene of reverent and thankful celebration. American troops accepted the invitation to join the celebration. A unit of the French forces of the interior made an appearance. Men of the French Navy marched side by side with the American liberators. Highlight of the ceremony was the renaming of the public square. Henceforth, it will bear the name of the first French leader to repudiate collaboration with the Nazis. Later, the celebration struck a gayer note, and by next Bastille Day, all of France will be able to dance and sing again. Inside Germany, a peace movement has announced itself with a blast of a bomb. Veteran German generals, who know the war already has been lost, have made an attempt against Adolf Hitler's life. Since then, one Prussian head after another has fallen in the most spectacular blood purge since Hitler's massacres of June 1934. Even the Luftwaffe is no longer trusted. Defenders are on the watch for planes piloted by anti-Nazi rebels. Suspicion and distrust is rampant among all Wehrmacht factions. The Prussian commanders have admitted what the Nazis know but refuse to admit. Germany already is irrevocably doomed. The oppressive Nazi game is up. Goering and Hitler, who set out to conquer the world, have suddenly learned that they have not even conquered Germany.